Greetings and welcome, gentles and ladies, men, to another installment of Donkey Kong Country Remake or Rebreak. I'm X Paradigm Gamer, and today we're finally reviewing the gaming masterpiece that is Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest. I've been looking forward to this day ever since I started this channel back in April of 2013. I'll try to keep things shorter than last time, but at the same time, I've got a lot to say about this game. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the review. As mentioned last time, Donkey Kong Country did pretty well during its original run in 1994. Reception from gamers and critics alike were positive, and sales were through the roof. And as we all know, well-received and selling games are all but guaranteed to get a sequel. I'm disappointed to say that I couldn't find out much about this game's development history, except that a Virtual Boy version was planned but then cancelled after that system flopped. Regardless, a sequel did surface in November of 1995, entitled Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest. You wouldn't believe how long it took me to recognize the pun in the title. Like its prequel, DKC2 received accolades from critics and was a commercial success as well. DKC2 appears to be the fan favorite of the original trilogy, though plenty will argue that Donkey Kong Country 1 is the better game. One of them is Stuttering Craig of ScrewAttack.com, who insists that Donkey Kong Country 1 is better than the sequels because it had Wow Factor. Riddle me this, Craig. What do you call Wow Factor viewed in retrospect? Nostalgia. Games should be judged based on their design, not based on your memories of how impressive something was over 20 years ago. Now, if you want to make an argument based on the actual design of the games, then I can actually respect your opinion. But Stuttering Craig is not the only one who believes DKC1 is the better game. In recent years, a vocal minority of gamers have come out in defense of this position. Some of them being fans of the series who have a simple preference, others being people who only really grew up with DKC1 and don't care as much for the sequels, and still others being newcomers who prefer DKC1 just because they played it first. Some people hold this preference respectfully, and others not so much. At the end of the day, it's just an opinion, and I'm not going to judge people over it. After all, I am the guy who likes Sonic 1 more than Sonic 2. But on the topic of DKC1 versus DKC2, I do not hesitate to cast my vote with the majority. As far as I'm concerned, not only is DKC2 the better game, but it is so by a considerable margin. Like the first game, DKC2 also saw a portable re-release nine years after the Super Nintendo version in November. 2004. Despite garnering somewhat better reception than the first remake, Donkey Kong Country 2 on GBA has been similarly repudiated as a dirty, second-tier handheld abortion of an SNES classic. And once again, I must dissent. The remake of Donkey Kong Country 2 on GBA may be flawed like its predecessor, but it is so much better than it's given credit for. Thus, like all ROR installments, I'll be giving both games an in-depth comparison to see what's what. This is Donkey Kong Country 2 Remake or Rebreak. Let's begin with the plot. As with the previous game, the SNES original gives you little more than bare bones information about the story. In the first level, you can enter K. Rule's cabin, and find a note which informs you that Donkey Kong has been Kongnapped by the Kremlin crew and is being held for a ransom of the Kong Banana Horde. The GBA remake, like its prequel, adds some cutscenes to round out the narrative and make it more complete. We open on the shores of Donkey Kong Island, with a lovely remix of Diddy Kong Racing's theme playing in the background. After the events of the first game, DK has decided to take some time off from the video game hero business. May I say how much I love this visual of Donkey Kong sitting in a lawn chair and sipping a banana milkshake? After DK blows up Cranky in a rather amusing exchange of dialogue, a reptilian looking airship descends from the sky, piloted by none other than the callous and cantankerous Captain K. Rule and the contemptuous Kremlin crew. Livid from his defeat in the first game, K. Rule sends his Kremlin minions down to Donkey Kong Island and abducts DK before disappearing into the clouds. Moments later, Diddy Kong and his girlfriend, a chimpanzee named Dixie Kong, arrive at the scene and discover a ransom note from the Kremlins. The captain reveals that DK's safe return will be guaranteed only if the Kongs relinquish their banana horde. While the other Kongs quarrel amongst themselves as to whether it's worth giving in to K. Rule's demands, Diddy and Dixie volunteer to infiltrate the Kremlin's pirate fortress on Crocodile Isle and rescue DK from the clutches of Captain K. Rule and the Kremlin crew. The other Kongs join the effort, and Diddy and Dixie take off for the island. 
like with the previous game, Diddy's Conquest wins no awards for its storytelling. Still, I consider it to be a fun setup for a Donkey Kong game, especially in regards to Diddy's character. Taking charge as the main playable character, Diddy undergoes a sort of rite of passage on a journey of growth to rescue his role model and establish himself as a video game hero in his own right. Dixie Kong is also a great character. Not only is she adorable, but unlike a lot of female protagonists in gaming these days, she doesn't have to be gritty or one of the boys in order to kick ass and take names. I'm also a fan of the banana shaped ponytail. I have heard some people complain that the Kong napping plot point makes the story too generic, but I say that if Streets of Rage can do it, then so can Donkey Kong. Let's move on to dem aesthetics. Going back to my review of the first Donkey Kong Country, I stated that it was a great looking game. While I still stand by that position, I did notice during my many hours of editing the review just how much brown, grey, and white there was in the color scheme. Donkey Kong Country 2 is a bit of a different story. All of the different level types, with maybe two exceptions, have a fuller and more engaging color palette. Even the mine levels have a nice mix of warms and cools in the rock, with bright yellow crystals twinkling in the background. In case I'm not making myself obvious, I think Donkey Donkey Kong Country 2 is a gorgeous game, hands down better looking than the first. Not only do the environments make good use of parallax scrolling, not only does it have a more vibrant color palette, not only does it make use of nifty graphical effects, but the stronger rendering quality also makes it look even more realistic than DKC1 did. And that's not even mentioning the sprites, which are also better modeled and animated than those of the previous game. Once again, I really find myself enjoying the art direction. I wasn't super keen on the pirate theme at first, but it quickly became one of my favorite things about this game. It distinguishes DKC2 from its prequel and gives it an identity of its own. Even so, DKC2 still manages to be a much more varied game in terms of art design. Donkey Kong Country 1 was Jungle Island themed, and while there's nothing wrong with that, it seems almost uninspired when compared to Diddy's Conquest. While DKC1 had jungles, temples, mines, and caves, DKC2 has pirate ships, roller coaster rides, crystal mines, brambles, and swamps, in addition to the more stereotypical volcanoes, castles, and ice caves. And then there are the enemies, who has before managed to be the right combination of realistic and cartoony. Your favorite baddies from DKC1 see a reincarnation here, decked out in scarves, tricorn hats, and peg legs. Clump has become the cannonball firing cannon, headscarf wearing mini neckies now dive bomb you from above, and the hopping critters from the first game now bounce around on pogo peg legs. Pogo peg legs. Now that's using your imagination. A batch of new enemies also join the fray, and they're all distinct and memorable as well, like the hook throwing crooks and the oversized sword lugging cutlasses. Old DKC2 has a slightly more serious tone than the first, the art direction is still oozing with charm and creativity. I can say truthfully and without a doubt that Donkey Kong Country 2 is my favorite looking game on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. So how does the GBA version compare graphically? Before jumping into this, I'd like to reiterate that the GBA's small screen size necessarily presented some limitations for developers trying to port SNES games to the GBA. Overall, I find that the GBA remake of DKC2 is in a similar position to the previous remake. The SNES version clearly looks better and I won't argue to the contrary, but at the same time, DKC2 is still a spectacular looking game by GBA standards. As with the last remake, all the special effects from the console version are recreated here, including the 3D backgrounds. Even if you disagree with me, I think we can at least compromise that Rare did a better job porting the graphics for this game than they did for DKC1. The sprites don't look quite as muddy, and the saturation seems much better. The graphics that were added to flesh out new additions also look pretty decent. Similar to its home console cousin, I consider the portable remake of DKC2 to be the best looking game on the Game Boy Advance. We still have yet to touch on the soundtrack by David Wise, and oh my hylia is it amazing. I could make an entire video discussing my thoughts on just the music in this game. It's that fucking good. DKC1 was a great sounding game as well, but for every AAA track like Life in the Mines or DK Island Swing, there was an okay one like Voices of the Temple or Misty Menace. DKC2, on the other hand, is a virtually flawless collection of tunes. Every single track in this game equals, if not surpasses, the best that DKC1 had to offer. The instrumentation is exceptional, the melodies are memorable and catchy, and every track has just the right splash of ambience. One of my favorites is Mining Melancholy, the track that plays during the Crystal Mine levels. Though dominated by the percussive beat of pickaxes and digging tools slamming against the rock, some piano and humming from the zinger enemies give the track a strong emotional appeal. Thank you. 
The genre variety is also through the roof. Hothead Bop, Snaky Shanty, and Token Tango go for a big band styling. Jib Jig has a traditional Irish flair. Disco Train has a fun dance beat. And Forest Interlude and Sticker Brush Symphony offer an orchestrated sound. And speaking of Sticker Brush Symphony, what a fantastic song that is. I don't think it's overrated in the slightest. Very few video game songs manage to pull off its unique combination of catchy and emotional while still fitting perfectly into the game proper. What impresses me most is that while it took three people to compose DKC one, David Wise was able to create this 32 some track masterpiece completely on his own. Some of you may have wondered why in the last review I called him my favorite video game composer. Well, it's quite simple. He composed my favorite video game soundtrack. Well done, sir. So how does the music in the GBA version compare? Once again, I feel it's undeservedly pissed upon simply for sounding different than the SNES version. As with the DKC1 remake, I think this is one spectacular sounding GBA game. And while I'm sure that many are probably going to want to kill me for saying this, I just might prefer it to the SNES soundtrack. <gasps> it seems to me like most of the tracks saw an improvement of some kind in the transition. I prefer the GBA's rendition of Clomp's Romp in a Snowbound Land, Bayou Boogie, Swanky Swing, Crook's March, Boss Bossa Nova, Forest Interlude, Hothead Bop, Jib Jig, the second half of Crocodile Cacophony, and yes, even Sticker Brush Symphony. Other tracks like Club is Revile, Mining Melancholy, Token Tango, Disco Train, Snakey Shanty, Blood of the Zinger, and Cranky's Conga also sound pretty good for a GBA game. The new tracks for the story intro, Expresso Racing, and the Funky's Flight minigame are also fabulous. The only tracks I consider to have suffered a downgrade in the transition are Haunted Chase, Run Ramby Run, Primal Rave, Schoolhouse Harmony, and the first half of Crocodile Cacophony. Like last time, I also find myself preferring the sound design in the GBA remake over the SNES original. The sound effects have better clarity and their cartoonish flair better fits the Donkey Kong universe. I'm sure that there are plenty of people who disagree agree with me, but I think we can at least agree that Rare did a better job recreating DKC2 soundtrack for GBA than they did with DKC1. The overall instrument quality seems improved, and the tunes sound relatively similar to the SNES versions. At the end of the day, I love either version of the soundtrack more than words can describe. Let's get on to DAT gameplay. As mentioned before, Diddy's Conquest takes place on the sinister Crocodile Isle, a pirate fortress of seven mandatory worlds, each consisting of four to six quirkily named levels. Like the last game on SNES, you can only move between worlds after reaching a Funky's Flights for a given world. Additionally, you'll have to make it to the Kong College and speak with Wrinkly Kong in order to save the game. And as before, the location of Kong College can be early on in a world or near the end. One complaint that a lot of DKC1 fans often bring up involves the save feature. DKC2 introduces banana coins to the franchise, which are collected in stages and spent on various services provided by the other Kongs. The first time you visit Wrinkly Kong in a world, you can save for free. Each time after that, you'll have to pay two banana coins per save, and a lot of people don't like that. While they understand where people are coming from and agree that it wasn't the best design choice out there, I really don't see why people make such a huge deal out of it. Is it really that hard to find two banana coins in a stage? Even during my very first playthrough, I always had enough to get by. Regardless, this is something that is changed for the better in the GBA version. Pressing start on the world map will open an inventory screen, where you can save the game or access one of Funky these gyrocopters at any time. So if you really, really hate paying to save, then just play the GBA version. In terms of game mechanics, DKC2 is largely the same as its predecessor. You're still hopping and bopping your way through side-scrolling stages, you're still bouncing off of or bowling into enemies to kill them, and you're still recovering your Kong compatriot from buddy barrels for use as a second hit point. The control is just as solid as last time, though there are two small but noticeable improvements. One, the Kongs will now hold in place when throwing barrels in midair, it can also throw barrels directly upwards, allowing for more stable aiming. Two, you no longer slow to a stop after completing a rolling move, which helps to keep up the pace. Regarding the GBA control, I find it to be an improvement over the previous remake. The slipperiness is gone and it approximates the SNES control well enough. Another addition that I really like is the team up move. If you happen to have both Kongs, you can jump onto each other's shoulders and throw a Kong towards collectibles and platforms. You can also use them as a projectile for defeating enemies. It's a very useful and fun mechanic, and one that I would have loved to see come back in the Return series. Like the previous games, the two Kongs play slightly differently. As before, Diddy is slightly faster, jumps higher, and rolls longer distances. Dixie, meanwhile, can do a helicopter spin move that allows her to make short work of tricky platforming and nab goodies that Diddy can't. A lot of DKC1 fans are keen to remind us of how 
awful it is that Donkey Kong himself is not playable this time around. If that's seriously preventing you from enjoying this game, then you don't know what a nitpick is. Regardless, I opine that Diddy and Dixie make for the better Kong duo. Dixie's helicopter spin makes the game's platforming more forgiving for beginners, while Diddy's more versatile moveset makes him great for more experienced players who can learn to use him properly. Bananas, balloons, banana coins, and Kong letters again abound in stages, giving players ample opportunities to score extra lives. Barrels and other projectiles return, but there's a much more interesting variety here than there was in DKC1. My favorite addition is the treasure chests, which yield goodies upon impact. In terms of level design, you'll remember that I praised DKC1 for keeping things straightforward and fast-paced, while offering a sufficient number of new stage hazards and set pieces to shake things up. While I stand by those claims, I still find that DKC2's level design is a significant improvement over that of its prequel. As before, things are straightforward, fast-paced, and linear, while also offering bonus rooms for more explorative players. But in contrast to 90% of DKC1 stages, which were mostly horizontal dashes for the exit, DKC2 throws helpings of vertical platforming into the mix for greater structural variety. In addition to the more creative and engaging cast of pirate-themed baddies, the levels offer much more interesting stage hazards and set pieces than last time around. And this is where the level design of Diddy's Conquest truly shines. Unlike DKC1, every single level in this game does something new. Barrel Blast progresses via maze-like grid of barrel cannons. Target Terror sees the player riding along in a weird looking roller coaster jumping at plus and minus barrels to open barriers. Red Hot Ride traverses over open lava and colorful blue balloons, dodging zingers and other enemies along the way. Toxic Tower sees the player racing for the top against a rising pool of caustic green liquid. Parachute Panic uses a purple squawks to bob and weave through a horde of zingers. And speaking of squawks, animal buddies also see a return, and they greatly compound the game's variety. Rambi the Rhino and Engard the Swordfish return, and are largely unchanged from last time. Squawks the Parrot also reappears, though he is now fully playable and capable of spitting eggs as a projectile attack. New animal buddies include the high-jumping Rattly the Rattlesnake and the web-spinning Squitter the Spider. Two more buddies, Glimmer the Anglerfish and Clapper the Seal, act as stage-specific set pieces. Not only do all of the buddies control exceptionally well, not only do they all have interesting and unique abilities, not only do they now have all new supercharged moves, but this time around, certain levels have been designed with specific animal buddies in mind. Radley takes the helm for Rattle Battle, Squitter platforms about in Web Woods, Ramby runs for his life in Ramby Rumble, On Guard maneuvers through Arctic Abyss, and Squawks races for the finish in Screech's Sprint. I simply cannot express how much I love playing as the animal buddies in this game. It keeps the variety going and only bolsters an already fantastic collection of stages. And it's this variety that I think ultimately allows Diddy's Conquest to beat up Donkey Kong Country 1. The game gives you everything it's got without a dull moment to its name. The same thing goes for the boss battles, which are a huge improvement over DKC1's lackluster face-offs. Unlike DKC1, which recycled a lot of bosses, every single one of DKC2's bosses is unique and requires a different strategy to defeat. Some might peg Creepy Crow as a repeat, but the structure of the two crow fights are more than different enough for me to be satisfied. A neat addition in the GBA version is that after defeating Crow for the first time, Creepy Crow will actually drift out of his corpse. Cranky snarky quips at the end of every boss battle also never fail to put a smile on my face. On top of their variety, the bosses also periodically change up their attack cycles, keeping the player on their toes and maintaining the tension. Like DKC2's excellent platforming stages, the boss fights are tons of fun. And then there are the small and oft ignored touches that upgrade DKC2 from an excellent game to an amazing one. The little things that show you that the developers knew they were making something special. Each stage ends with a mini game that allows you to win extra lives and other goodies, which makes finishing a level feel special and rewarding. Both Kongs also have a charming victory animation. Diddy will bust out a boombox and drop some DK jam while Dixie will play some neat riffs on her blue bass guitar. Depending on the stage, the victory jingle will change slightly. Each type of stage has its own rendition of the Donkey Kong Country death jingle as well. While the GBA version lacks some of these things due to cartridge limitations, it does at least give Diddy and Dixie unique death jingles. <laughs> Ha ha ha!
Another thing I like is how whenever you approach a boss, the Kongs will let out a frightened scream and their eyes will bug out. Another nifty quirk is that Dixie Kong doesn't pick up barrels with her hands. She uses her ponytail to lift them over her head. The game's dialogue is also extremely amusing and memorable. And on top of everything else, Donkey Kong Country 2 manages to offer a decent amount of challenge. DKC2 is widely regarded as the hardest game in the trilogy, and naturally there have been plenty of complaints regarding the game's difficulty balancing, particularly from newcomers to the series and DKC1 fans to a lesser extent. Let me be clear that I have no problem with other people enjoying games like Battletoads, Ninja Gaiden, or Sonic the Hedgehog 2. But I'm afraid I must wholeheartedly disagree if you mean to tell me that DKC2 has the worst difficulty balancing of the bunch. Like its predecessor, Donkey Kong Country 2 understands that games should be well designed and fun to play first, and difficult to finish second. It's a reasonably challenging and rewarding experience whose difficulty stems from proper sources of real challenge. Mastery of simple to learn mechanics, straightforward but engaging level design, and a sufficiently lenient margin of error. Like all good hard games, DKC2 starts off relatively tame to ease you into the mechanics, and gets organically harder as the game progresses. The save feature also negates the issues of a beat in one sitting design philosophy. Checkpoints are also abundant and largely start you off where you'd like them to. Enemies will keep you on your toes, but will never overstay their welcome. Kong letters, bananas, and a cornucopia of balloons will keep you amply stocked with extra lives and make sure that even the least skilled players can reach the end of the game. Yes, the game is hard, and you're guaranteed to die plenty of times, but it's never unreasonably hard. So long as you're willing to keep trying, you will beat this game. On top of that, I find that the visibility problems of DKC1 and SNES have been largely corrected this time around. I can't think of a single instance where I died or was otherwise encumbered by a bad camera. The remake once again attempts to prevent screen crunch with smaller sprites, and again offers better visibility than the SNES original. With the exception of some frustrating stages in the Lost World, Donkey Kong Country 2 is very, very playable. And for players who have mastered the standard ROM, Donkey Kong Country 2 once again offers bonus rooms for hardcore players and completionists. And in general, I find that the bonus room system is majorly improved over DKC1. The big problem there was that the game really didn't reward you for going after them, beyond breaking rights. In DKC2, bonus rooms become short minigames you play to score creme coins, doubloons with K. Rule's face on them. You'll either have to beat a certain number of enemies, collect a certain number of stars, or simply make it to the end. Each bonus bonus room is unique and offers a short burst of high octane fun. The locations of the bonus rooms themselves are also much less cryptic than they were last time, and you can always pay Cranky for useful hints if you don't know where to go. Upon collecting 15 creme coins, you'll be able to visit Clava's kiosk and enter the secret 8th world of the game, the Kremlin Lost World. There are 5 optional levels here, and they're easily the hardest in the game. Lots of people hate animal antics where you marathon a level as all 5 animal buddies, but even the infamous squawks section isn't that bad if you just take it slow and steady. The GBA version is also nice enough to move the star barrel to the beginning of the squawk section. Clobber Carnage and Fiery Furnace, on the other hand, can both go fuck themselves. I love this game to death, but some really obnoxious enemy placement and annoying barrel cannon sections prevent me from enjoying either stage. And though the GBA version does improve animal antics, it also makes Fiery Furnace worse by speeding up the zingers in the bonus room for no fucking reason. Completing the Lost World unlocks the true final boss and ending of the game. So not only are bonus rooms themselves more fun to play, but playing them rewards you with exclusive content. In case that hasn't already got completionists salivating, each level also contains a hidden DK coin to increase Diddy's status as a video game hero. In case all of that isn't enough to satisfy you, the GBA version has even more side quests. Like the previous remake, DKC2 on GBA introduces a status screen to better keep track of how many bonus rooms and golden feathers you found in the stage. Additionally, the scrapbook mechanic also returns. This time it's a lot more obvious which enemies you have to kill to get what photo. You can also visit Wrinkly to pay for hints on photo locations, and if you fill up a page, he'll give you a DK coin. So once again, you'll have to complete the scrapbook if you want to 102% the remake. Swanky Kong's bonus bonanza returns, and as before, you can play a super fun trivia game to earn some extra lives. The GBA version also sports a cameo from Candy Kong. Funky's Flights now offers a series of flying minigames where you take control of a gyrocopter and accomplish an objective for DK coins. While the first the first mission is meh. 
and the second and third missions suck hairy gorilla balls, the rest of them aren't half bad and contain some interesting level design. Cranky Kong's Monkey Museum now sports an Expressa racing minigame where you take control of the eponymous ostrich and race against other birds for trophies. Getting first place will earn you a DK coin, but that's easier said than done. In order to prep Expresso for a successful race, you'll have to track down the golden feathers located in each level. You can use them to upgrade Expresso along four stats, but let me tell you folks, none of them really mean jack shit besides speed. All that boost and fly do is allow you to carry more power-ups from the track, and your competition will always snatch them up before you can even get close to them. Strength doesn't seem to do anything at all. Even with a well-upgraded Expresso, these races often feel like luck-based crapshoots. There's nothing wrong with making them hard, but it seems like if you can't get in the lead at the very beginning, you're gonna lose. While Expresso Racing was a fun idea, the execution leaves a lot to be desired. Believe it or not, Clubba has a minigame too, but you don't get anything for playing it, and it really isn't anything special. Overall, both versions of DKC2 offer plenty of meat for completionist types, and are much more rewarding than DKC1, with the GBA version adding even more fun extras. Like with DKC1, I find that 102 percenting Donkey Kong Country 2 is a really fun and enjoyable experience. With that, I think it's time we jumped into the spoiler section. Ah, spoiler alert! After finishing off Creepy Crow and Gloomy Gulch, the Kongs arrive at K. Rule's Keep, where DK is supposedly being locked up. After making their way through some of the toughest levels in the game, the Kongs reach the top of the fortress and steady themselves for a face-off against the captain. You dirty motherfucker! I do have to say, there is a strange satisfaction knowing that after coming all this way up the island, that K. Rule is actually frightened enough to run away like a coward. Things are a little different in the GBA version. Instead of the cutscene we just saw, the Kongs will be ambushed by an all new boss, the giant Kremlin Kerosene. The first section with the cleavers always felt tacked on to me, but the rest of the battle fits right in with DKC2's already exceptional collection of boss battles. After racing K. Rule's parrot to the finish in Screech's sprint, the Kongs board his air Ship, the Flying Croc, which I'm almost certain is a reference to the Gargantua from Battletoads. <laughs> Damn, K. Rule's not fucking around. DKC2's boss fights are all excellent, and the final showdown with Captain K. Rule is no exception. This time around, he'll go after you with a cannonball shooting blunderbuss, which is also capable of spurting out flames and popping off magic blasts. Unlike the first game's final boss, Captain K. Rule offers a much more dynamic fight that will keep you guessing and fully engaged until the very end. If I had to nitpick, the fight does overstay its welcome by about 30 seconds, and it's a lot to have to redo if you die towards the end. Luckily, the game is at least nice enough to throw you some buddy barrels after every few hits or so. In general, this is a fun and reasonably challenging final boss that does a good job capping off the game's difficulty curve. After exploding K. Rule's blunderbuss for a ninth time, Donkey Kong will free himself from his binds and Falcon punch K. Rule through the roof, who is then mobbed by a pack of sharks. Now that's satisfying. The GBA remake also had the short cutscene of the Kongs escaping the Flying Croc and returning to DK Island. Like last time, the game's cast of baddies and buddies will arrive at Clubba's kiosk for a roll call, with the GBA version adding swanky new animations and backdrops. But the game's not over yet. In the GBA version, Captain K. Rule will crash land in the depths of the Kremlin Lost World and dare the Kongs to face him for a second time. After making their way through the Lost World, the Kongs arrive at Crocodile Core and square off with the Kremlin Commander once again. After dodging a barrage of cannonballs, the Kongs backfire the blunderbuss a final time and send K. Rule reeling into the core of Crocodile Isle. What follows is one of my all-time favorite video game endings. The Kongs staring into the horizon, the rolling waves, the exploding island, K. Rule riding off into the sunset and laughing all the way. It's brilliant. In the GBA version, Funky Kong will also bomb K. Rule's raft. While that's nice and all, I strongly prefer the more melancholy presentation of the SNES original. With that, Diddy's Conquest comes to an end. So, remake or rebreak? 
What's the verdict? Like with the previous port, I opine that the GBA version of Donkey Kong Country 2 deserves a remake score. DKC2 on GBA is a strong recreation of the original, which despite its flaws, fixes some of the problems of the original and adds new content. The pay to save and world travel issues have been corrected with the new inventory screen, which also houses hints for bonus rooms and scrapbook photos, along with the status screen. Yes, the graphics are slightly downgraded and the music sounds different, but both still remain impressive by the standards of the Game Boy Advance, and I find that the sound design has improved as well. While the mini games aren't as good as DKC ones, they're still generally fun and worthwhile additions to an already amazing game. The scrapbook mechanic is also as great as it was last time. Even if you disagree and consider the game a rematch, I think we can at least compromise that Rare did a better job porting this game than they did with DKC1. The graphics look nicer, the music sounds more refined, and the control issues have been ironed out. Unlike the last game where some personal quibbles led me to prefer the SNES original over the GBA remake, I couldn't tell you which version of DKC2 was my favorite. They're both great games, and I love them equally. As for Diddy's Conquest as a game on its own, can you guys see why I prefer it over Donkey Kong Country? The only way I could possibly see the first game as better than the second is if I owned a tight-fitting pair of rose-tinted DKC1 nostalgia goggles. The graphics are more colorful, more detailed, better modeled, and better animated. The soundtrack is the best I've heard in a video game. The controls are more refined, and the player characters are more balanced. The level design is significantly improved over the first in a variety of aspects. The boss battles are much more varied and interesting to play. The bonus room system is more rewarding, and the DK coins, golden feathers, and scrapbook photos offer exploration to supplement the linear and straightforward level design. Top all of that off with a charming pirate theme and a host of small but endearing design choices, and you got what I consider the best classic side-scrolling game ever made. Seriously, why can't this game be considered as good as Super Mario World or Sonic 3 and Knuckles? As well as as those games are, they aren't anywhere near as quirky, unique, challenging, or memorable as this game is. Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest is one of my absolute most favorite games of all time, perhaps second only to a certain 3D Mario game, and I love it to death. And if you haven't played it for whatever reason, then what the hell are you doing watching this review? Go download the SNES original off the Wii U Virtual Console for 8 bucks, or go buy the excellent GBA remake online for 12 bucks. I don't care which version, just do yourself a favor and try this masterpiece for yourself. Even if you didn't care for the first game, I think the sequel's many improvements will be enough for you to have at least a decent time. I love this game to death, and I think you will too, so long as you're interested enough to the challenge. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Join me next time when I review the final game in the original trilogy, Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble. Also for the Super Nintendo and Game Boy Advance. Yeah, no box, I'm sorry. Until then, I'm Xperidon Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review.